Welcome, I'm Mark Robbins. I'm the president of the American Academy in Rome. Thank you for braving the cold. Uh, I think we have a, a, an exciting evening and it's great to see so many friends, uh, friends of the Academy in the audience. Uh, this is our first uh, US Conversations. The Conversation series was started about um, three years ago. And the idea was to bring the work of Rome Prize uh, fellows and residents out to um, a larger field, both across the United States and, of course, in Rome. And we're pleased to recognize our season's sponsor, uh, the Helen Frankenthaler Foundation, which is dedicated to promoting greater public interest in and the understanding of the visual arts. It's really their generosity that's made these evenings possible, both last year's series and this year's series. Um, and in particular, it's enabled us to take this program and present this in cities like Houston and Los Angeles and Chicago. Uh, the Foundation's Executive Director, Elizabeth Smith, is with us tonight. And again, Elizabeth, thank you very much. For those of you who don't know us, the American Academy in Rome is uh, the leading international center for independent work and research in the arts and humanities um, abroad. Each year, some of the nation's most gifted scholars and artists compete for the Rome Prize, which is given in 13 disciplines, from art to ancient studies, from musical composition to art history and design. Fellows come to this unique interdisciplinary community in Rome to live and work for anywhere from six months, and if you're very lucky, two years, uh, if you're a pre-doc. And this is an amazingly valuable time. It gives you the space to think and to work. Residents are also invited to join the community each year, and they also go across the disciplines represented at the Academy, including writers like our panelist, Andre Asiman, uh, performers like Anna Devere Smith and Ping Chong, scholars like Dietrich Neumann, Shaidi Barch, uh, and Mary Beard, uh, composers David Lang. The list goes on both of artists but creative individuals who are really pushing the understanding of the arts and humanities. The community is increasingly global in nature and underscores the value, especially now, of intellectual and creative work in a civil society. Recently, an exhibition that the Academy had organized, A View of One's Own, uh, closed at the Arthur Ross Gallery at Penn. Let's see if I can get an image up. This was an exhibition of the work of, uh, the photographic work of three women who lived across three generations. This is the work of Esther Van Damon, a, a, a pioneering uh, archaeologist who was at the American Academy in 1901. Uh, and we showed this work, uh, uh, which shows obviously the development of the city of Rome over successive generations. But what's interesting here is each one of the photographers provided a view of the Eternal City, but it's through the choices of what they chose to frame that constructed their own city, at once documentary and personal. Our program tonight looks at Alexandria, another city of the ancient world from an earlier empire as a point of intersection. Alexandria is a city of myth, and reconstructed views remembered often for things that no longer exist. It's lighthouse and the burned library. This is a good metaphor. <laughs> the burned library that was meant to hold all of the world's knowledge. Uh, wow, it, it was better in a black screen. Uh, I like the way they've conflated the library and the lighthouse. It all is a very compressed narrative. Um, but like these images of the city, partially mythic, partially uh, archaeological, uh, like Rome, cities are simultaneously about their ancient past and about modern memories. In this case, writer 
Andre Asiman describes the now lost Alexandria of his youth. In his memoir, which was written in 1995, Out of Egypt, architects Craig Dykers and Elaine Molinar designed a new library, the Bibliotheca Alexandrina in, um, uh, again, we're, <laughs> Uh, this Andre Asiman's family, <laughs> or the, the family from whence he came. And uh, the uh, new Bibliotheca Alexandrina, which was built in 2002. Interestingly, a building that was movingly defended by citizens of Alexandria during the upheavals of 2011. And historian Joseph Viscomi's uh, manuscript the Migrant Mediterranean, which deals with decolonization and the repatriation of Italians from Egypt in the period from 1933 to 1967. The work of our panelists explores the histories of individuals and place and the imperfect overlap between past and present and our own memories. These, uh, this panel tonight really grew out of a kind of spontaneous discussion that took place when uh, Craig and Joseph, Elaine, and Andre were in residence at the academy. And they realized they all had this common theme that Alexandria and Egypt played a part in their lives. And so it was originally called the Alexandria Quartet after the Lawrence Durrell, I'm assuming, Lawrence Durrell books. Um, Elaine, unfortunately, can't be with us tonight, so it's now a trio. <laughs> so we'll need to make do with that. Um, I'd, I'd like to just give brief uh, introductions to our speakers, and then I'll ask the speakers to come up to, um, to have a discussion, after which we'll open up the, um, uh, to the audience for questions. Andre Asiman is the distinguished professor, distinguished professor at the Graduate Center, the City University of New York. He's the author of two collections of essays, False Papers, Essays on Exile and Memory, and Alibis, Essays on Elsewhere. His four novels include Call Me By Your Name. I think uh, many of you have heard about the announcements about the Oscars. Three, I think, Andre. Sorry. Four. <laughs> Thank you. So much for Wikipedia. Um, uh, which, of course, was made into a, a stunning film, which is in theaters now. And he's co-authored and edited The Proust Project and Letters of Transit. Andre is the recipient of a Whiting Writers Award and fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the New York Public Library's Kuhlman Center for Scholars and Writers. His writings appeared in the New York Times and the New Yorker, among others, and he's the director of the Writers Institute at the Graduate Center, as well as the Center for, for the Humanities and of the Critical Theory Certificate Program. Craig Dykers is, um, was also a resident in 2015 and is one of the founding partners of Snowheda, the architectural firm that since 1989 has established offices in Norway, Egypt, England, and the United States. Uh, Craig has led many of Snowhead's prominent projects internationally, in addition to the Alexandria Library, which you had seen. These include the Norwegian National Opera in Oslo, and um, the recently completed expansion to the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Uh, closer to home, uh, you can see his work in the National's uh, September 11th Memorial Museum. Uh, downtown, and also in the Times Square reconstruction. It's quite a scale shift. Snowhead has received numerous awards, including the Mies van der Rohe Prize, the World Architecture Award, and the Aga Khan Award, among many others. He's a fre frequent visiting professor in architecture and also an honorary fellow of the Royal Institute of British Architects. Uh, Joseph Viscomi is currently the faculty fellow at the Center for European and Mediterranean Studies at New York University. He was a fellow of the American Academy in Rome. Uh, Joseph completed his joint PhD in anthropology and history at the University of Michigan in 2016. His primary research interests are in migration, geopolitics, and historical consciousness in the modern Mediterranean. His writing builds on work in archives, 
uh, often through oral histories and ethnographic research that's been supported by a Fulbright Award, a CES Mellon Dissertation Fellowship, and the Rome Prize. Joseph is working on essays in several upcoming publications, including the Journal of Modern History, Archivio Storico dell'Emigrazione Italiana, and a collected volume on Mediterranean studies. So with that, I'd like to welcome our um, speakers to the, to the stage. Um, well, thank you all for being here. Um, I just want to say a word about the American Academy. Um, I spent, uh, three years ago, I spent a month there. And I think, it, I wouldn't be exaggerating if I said it was one of the shortest and best months of my life. Um, it was absolutely fantastic. The people were wonderful. The colleagues were great. The, the people just come in and out. And the place was fantastic. And above all, the food was just unbelievably good. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm going to be speaking a bit about Alexandria, but it's also about the Alexandria that I knew, which um, no longer exists. So it is. A bit in, um, a, a, it's not just a paradox. It's it's a complicated situation because everybody knows of the Alexandria of antiquity, and uh, that never existed or has stopped existing many centuries ago. But my Alexandria also stopped existing um, quite a few decades ago. So it's mythical in many many respects. And whenever I speak about Alexandria. Um, <coughs> I, I become not emotional, but I people begin to think that I actually adore the place, and I have to set them right. Um, I have very mixed feeling, and they are mixed in in sort of. I'm not using this as a metaphor. They're mixed because they are totally feelings that are tussling with each other constantly. Because I have not been able to decide what I was doing there, why was I there. Why was I, did I leave? Why was I made to leave? What is it that I take with me that makes me think of Alexandria every day of my life? Um, and if I try to iron some notion of what Alexandria is for me, after writing a book about growing up in Alexandria and writing so many essays about my life as a person who used to live in Alexandria, I have come to the sort of the conclusion that I was never really going to live in Alexandria when I was growing up there. It was always a fact that I was going to be leaving Alexandria. I don't think anybody lives in a place with the foreknowledge and the certitude that you will not be living here for much longer. Uh, you can say it's like life, where you know you're not going to be living forever, but it's it's a more of a, a condition of it's, it's. I don't want to call it an existential condition, but it is a troubled condition because you're looking at things and you already realize that you're not going to be looking at them possibly next year, possibly in three years, and so I always go back to a scene when I'm sitting in my aunt's bedroom. And she liked to sort of just lean over the window and look out, and look out onto the sea in Alexandria. And she would say to me, because she was a very nostalgic person, she would say to me, you know, every time I come out this window, I am reminded of the Seine in Paris. Um, and she longed to be at the Seine. Uh, as far as she was concerned, this was just make-believe, it was just make-do, until she would eventually be repatriated to France, which was not really her home because she had married a German person, and she was not even German to begin with because she was really Turkish. Uh, <laughs> but this is the kind, of, the, the kind of mess that you grow up with, and I won't talk to you about what religion I belong to because everybody of every religion belonged in my family, so that, that was also confusing, but at least there was no God, so that was easy. Um, but the, the real sense that I, I want to leave you with when I speak about Alexandria is that the Alexandria that I know is simply a construct of my memory. I have written a book about Alexandria, about growing up in Alexandria, and I am essentially reconstructing this city from things that I remember, particularly foods and smells and characters. 
um, because I don't like many people and therefore I remember them perfectly and my spite is sort of endless. Uh, and I, I have lots of spite. I mean, you can't grow up in Alexandria and pretend that you accept people as they are. Uh, that's not Alexandria, at least not mine. Um, but I want to leave you with the thought that as I'm looking out the window with my aunts, I'm realizing that, okay, I don't even know what the sand looks like, but the sand feels more like home to me than this sea that I'm looking at, which is just a body of water that unfortunately sort of haunts me for the, will haunt me for the rest of my life because there was nothing as beautiful and as tactile, you could almost touch it if you wanted to, as that sea. And I'll never be able to touch it again because it's never going to be the same. I'll never be in that house again. And yet I realize, of course, that now there is a possibility that I do love the Alexandrian Sea more than I've loved anything else. Maybe more than the American Academy, I don't know. Um, but um, it is something that I haven't been able to sort out. So as you write a book from memory, you're recreating, reinventing a city that has had a history of being reinvented. That's what you should bear in mind. So everybody talks about Lawrence Durrell's books, The Quartet, um, and of course he's not portraying the Alexandria that he saw or that anybody has seen because he's reinvented it. But that goes back into a tradition of reinvented Alexandrias. And as I'm writing my book, and maybe this is the last thing I'll say, as I'm writing my book, I'm realizing that I'm, I'm encountering this tradition of mythical writing. And, and I realize, as I'm putting down words, that mine too is a myth. I, I'm, I'm trying to be as accurate as I can, and I go to the New York Public Library to look up the map of Alexandria with the names of the streets that I remembered, because of course they've changed all the names of the streets. And, and, but that's, the, those are just factoids. The real facts, as far as I'm concerned, are something like memory and desire and imagination. That's where the whole thing lingers. And uh, which is why when I went back to Alexandria, I encountered a city that I remembered perfectly. I couldn't even get lost. I thought I'd get lost. How do I ask people if I get lost? How do I get to that place? I never got lost. There was nothing to get lost in. I, I was looking for a tombstone of my grandfather, whom I hadn't visited in the, the cemetery in probably 35 years. And I find the tombstone right away. And essentially, the city exists, but I didn't want it to exist this much. So as soon as I left, I felt that, okay, now I've got my Alexandria again. It's the Alexandria of paper, which is why I called my book False Papers. There, I'm really at home. All right. Thank you. Um, while I am an architect, uh, I am an architect who's always been interested in myth and poetry since I was a child. Um, there is a family of architects who um, follow these ideas in their work. Um, I had always read and been intrigued by Alexandria since I was very young, and so it was very natural for me to eventually work there as an architect. I was intrigued by um, the writers, of course, that we often focus upon who wrote about Alexandria. I found um, the love of history through E.M. Forrester. I began to understand uh, deceitful love through Durrell, uh, and of course, um, tearful love uh, through Cavafy as a young adult, all of these things driven by some sense of desire in the city. Uh, when my uh, world and connection to Alexandria began in 1989, after winning the architectural competition, uh, this new life that I had, a new connection to the city, uh, although beginning for me was the end for many other people who had been working on this project for quite some time. And of course, the ancient library of Alexandria existed some 2,300 years ago, so the story had already begun. And I would say, for the most part, many people refer to Alexandria as a city that requires the eyes of history, and of course it does. But the history is so multivalent, so layered, and so foggy, as Andre just mentioned, so reinvented. It's difficult really to call it history anymore. So I prefer to think of Alexandria as a city of stories rather than a city of history. The stories often have as much value as the history itself. 
Um, so I'm going to share a story with you uh, that uh, was part of my life, and this was what led to my connection to Alexandria in 1989. The story I'm going to tell you begins in 1974, and actually in 1974, Richard Nixon, President of the United States, uh, just two months, in June 1974, two months before he resigned, during the height of the Watergate crisis, visited Alexandria and met with Anwar Sadat in relationship to the peace accords that were occurring at the time, since the time of Nasser and beyond, uh, dealing with Arab-Israeli peace accords. So when Nixon arrived, he flew actually first to Alexandria, and he was greeted with the most enormous fanfare. It's actually very well documented, the visit, and it was on the cover of Time magazine, and it was amazing uh, greeting that the Egyptians gave Richard Nixon, who were apparent, the Egyptians were apparently unaware of anything happening <laughs> in the United States. And this is an actual, more or less documented fact. Over one million Egyptians rode camels and donkeys across the desert to line the parade route in Alexandria and the roads connecting Alexandria and Cairo to greet President Nixon uh, on this visit. When President Nixon arrived, uh, one of the first things that he commented upon was his capacity or ability to see the site or any remnants of the ancient library of Alexandria. Please, Mr. Sadat, may I visit the location of where this library used to be? And there was a kind of sudden stillness in the conversation. Nobody knew. There were no one in this group, including historians and academics, who had any inclination of where the library once stood, if it was even a single building, uh, and uh, in fact, there were no stones or remnants of it at all, no collection, no books, no, no papyri, no rolls, nothing. Uh, so there was just a kind of silence. What are we going to do? There was one particular person at that meeting. His name was Mustafa uh, Ab Abadi, who was an academic at uh, Alexandria University. And he recognized that in that moment that this was a great opportunity. Uh, there was a chance to potentially capitalize on this vast gap in history uh, and this kind of enormous interest in this great institution that in many ways is more fascinating to people than the great li uh, lighthouse of Alexandria, which is actually the wonder of the world. The library was not considered an ancient wonder of the world. So he took a chance and realized that um, he could maybe capitalize on this uh, international, potential international interest in, in the in revival of the library and put forward a proposal to bring a new library into Alexandria. At the time, uh, Nasser, who was before Sadat, uh, had already focused most of the uh, educational and cultural institutions in Cairo as he was uh, really consolidating his power there. So Abadi thought I could pull the power center away from Cairo, bring it to, uh, to Alexandria. He also saw the possibility to create a new cultural institution in the region that would have value to people in the Eastern Mediterranean. And finally, he thought maybe this library could be a bridge between the East and the West, since the ancient library really was a Hellenistic <coughs> building, uh, and it did bridge, in a sense, the Mediterranean, the southern ancient uh, um, uh, civilizations to, to Egypt and Northern Africa. Uh, so, and, and many of you may, of course, know this, but uh, the library was, in fact, Greek. Um, uh, Daniel Borstein, a former librarian of Congress, now deceased, who was at the first meeting and the presentation of the new design, looked into the audience at the Cataract Hotel in, in Aswan, surrounded by Egyptian dignitaries, including uh, President Mubarak, and just looked at everyone in the face and said, let me just remind you, the Alexandria Library is Greek. It's not Egyptian, and of course there was a tremendous kind of guffaw in the room because, uh, of course, everybody wanted to see it as Egyptian. Um, so he capitalized uh, a body, capitalized on the myth of reinvention and reconstitution of the city. He had five kind of key uh, ideas that he was going to weave into everybody's consciousness to bring this project into reality. The first was that, in fact, the library, being Greek, was a Greco-Roman or Hellenistic institution, which meant it was, in quotes, white. And if he was going to bring uh, money into this, he had to somehow link to the uh, populations of Europe and the West. Um, he also uh, capitalized on the myth that Alexandria was a gateway 
to to um, the ancient world and a gateway to the Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean, the Arab world. It was at one time, but it no longer was at the time Richard Nixon visited. He also wanted to capitalize on the idea of cosmopolitanism, which Alexandria at one time was quite cosmopolitan. It's less so now. And in the 1970s, when uh, internationalism was spreading around the world for better or worse, cosmopolitanism was a thing that people could grab onto. He also wanted to capitalize on the myth that the Library of Alexandria was the largest library in the world, in the ancient world. This has not been proven. Uh, there are different uh, stories of various libraries, including those in Carthage, that may have been bigger at different times. But what was important about the Library of Alexandria was the people that existed there, Galen, Hypatia, Callimachus, all these great scholars. This is what made the library great not necessarily the, th the contents of the library, although those were also great, um, but the interaction between great people and those contents made the library great. And the last thing that he capitalized on was the myth that the great library of Alexandria, Alexandria was this unbelievable temple, this kind of beautiful temple. Everyone believed that, and in fact, uh, later, as many um, people visited, as I visited, the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., the Librarian of Congress after Burstein uh, introduced the library to me by saying, we modeled this after the Great Library of Alexandria. And I was like, <laughs> how the hell did you know what it looked like? I've no Nobody knows what it looked like. And in fact, it was probably not one building. It was probably multiple buildings. It wasn't necessarily temple-like. But a, b a body wove all these things together. And everybody said, yeah, let's do this. So eventually, uh, after about a quarter of a century, they raised 200 20 million dollars uh, to um, build a new revival of, of this building. Uh, there were, for the architectural competition, about 1,400 entries from around the world. 700 uh, were actually delivered and 500 were accepted um, by the jury from over 70 countries and our practice was one of those companies. So to win a competition of that magnitude is um, quite uh, uh, hard to imagine. And I was 28 years old at the time, so I had a full head of hair, as much hair as Alexander the Great had when he was uh, 28 years old. But of course at 28, Alexander the Great was already on his way to India to conquer India, so you know I was just barely there. Um, we had uh, very little money, in fact no money, quite young. Uh, when we arrived, me and my colleagues, to accept the award in Alexandria, of which was a relatively small amount of money. In fact, all of the money that we received in the award was used to pay for the airplane tickets to go and receive the award in Alexandria. And when we arrived, uh, we had sort of sloppy clothes and uh, uh, it was an anonymous competition, so the uh, jury were there and they looked at us and, well, who are you? <laughs> well, we're the Snohetto, we're the architects, we just won this competition. And there was a kind of look of fear in their face, as there the little kids with long hair and holy jeans. And they said, well, you're too young to be the architects. And uh, I immediately just kind of out, of out of my mind just yelled out back at them, well, it's a good thing you chose a young architect because anyone older will be dead by the time this thing is finished. <laughs> And, and anyone older would also be smart enough to just walk away now, and we're just too young to know that. So we, we went on, and it took 13 years of work, uh, working seven days a week, uh, really 20 hours a day. The building was scheduled to be opened in October of 2001. And after 12 years of work, we were so excited. We had fallen prey to a body's mythological presence of this bridge between the East and the West and the revival of the, you know, the great Greco-Roman world and all of this. And so we thought this is just going to do it. And that was October 2001 and of course we all know what happened in September 2001, September 11th. Uh, the World Trade Center towers here were attacked and actually the leader of that group was an architect from Egypt. Uh, so nobody was going to go to Egypt to the opening. So actually the opening was uh, delayed by a full year as uh, the world kind of stopped. Today the building has 11,000 visitors roughly uh, per day, which is a great number of people um, for a library. It functions quite well. The uh, children's library has been expanded from 200 seats to 600 seats. One of the most interesting characteristics of the library is it is an institution which has over 50% of the staff population being female. So it is amongst the highest uh, um, uh, population of female um, staff for such an institution in the region, which is intriguing. Um, it operates outside the governmental regulations 
within Egypt, so it's a non-censored library. And as was mentioned earlier, uh, the, the building uh, was protected during the Arab Spring by a group of young people, both from the city and from the university, who formed a human chain around the building to protect it from violence, as um, actually 200 people died in the first weeks of the, the riots there, just within a kilometer of the library itself. Those people that protected the library were both pro-government and anti-government groups, set aside their differences, and they succeeded in making it happen. The last thing I'll say uh, about the project is that the, the ancient, and again, I think I'll, I'll, I agree that somehow all of this is post-rationalized. Whether uh, Alexandria was truly cosmopolitan and truly diverse, we may never really know. But at least this was a feeling that we all had in our company. And our company has since been created around that idea. So Snohetta, my company, it's named after a, a weird mountain in Norway that nobody knows how even to say the name. Uh, we are a bunch of people from all different places around the world and we throw our cultural baggage on the table and we try to coexist in this rather strange scholarly and artistic environment. So I think in some way the life of that library that started our company uh, continues uh, to be alive in how our studio operates. So um, I'm going to stop there, thank you. So uh, um, that's kind of a, a good spot actually for me to pick up because I'm going to start with that cosmopolitanism and and uh, my my encounter with the city of Alexandria actually starts kind of with this this mythic uh, mythic image of the city but it, but through a, a very different way and and I actually first encountered uh, this this narrative through. Uh, groups of, of hopeful migrants, uh, Egyptian migrants, who are looking to go uh, to Italy. And uh, what I was finding when I was talking to these people, this was an older research project that I had started, uh, was that these migrants were iterating this, this narrative of the Mediterranean where they saw some kind of genealogy that connected Italy, that connected Greece, that connected Egypt, that connected uh, this mythic map of the Mediterranean to their own personal experiences and, and the hopes that they had for the future. And what I found was that they kept kept talking about these communities that used to live there, and these, in in part, are the communities that that Andre comes from, that talks about in in his uh, memoirs. Um, so as as kind of the 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 curious historian, I began to to work to kind of unravel these narratives because knowing the Alexandria that I knew and the Egypt that I knew, uh, and this is in in the the early two thousands. Um, those communities didn't exist anymore. As Andre says, when he goes back, it's not there anymore. So I began to ask people, well, what happened? Where did people go? Uh, what did they leave behind? And, and that turned it itself into a, a research project. Um, so I began to see kind of history and, and the city itself as, as these knots, these, these dense entanglements of, of different historical trajectories uh, and different experiences uh, that I was working very slowly to unravel. And this was a project that took me from Egypt to Italy, from Italy to Switzerland, from Switzerland to the UK, to the US, to Australia, and virtually at least through Skype. Um, all over the place, and, and I, I began to really unpack this departure and this story of, of losing Alexandria, and that was the narrative that I was, I was dealing with. Uh, so it all started with this kind of contemporary migration, and it slowly worked its way back. Uh, and it, it ended up encapsulating all of these things. Uh, uh, the British occupation of Egypt in 1882, and that was one of the first things that I learned really kind of started to unravel this narrative of historic and timeless uh, cosmopolitanism when I realized that most of these communities of foreigners that had come to occupy such a central place in that narrative actually mostly arrived after uh, the British occupation of the city in 1882. Then there were the, these legal regimes that were kind of uh, artifacts of, of the late Ottoman period that preserved a set of privileges and protections for these different communities. Um, 
immigration and the changes in the structure uh, of, of Europe and then this long process of decolonization. So all of these different forces that were really acting on the city, shaping the city, but also shaping and affecting the lives of the people that were living there, uh, they began to kind of knot and twist with one another and create this very complex landscape that is the city that then becomes also this narrative of what the city is and what the city was and what the city can or, or will be. Um, and uh, what, I, what I began to kind of ask myself then is, is, is why and how this memory began uh, to take such a powerful hold uh, and, and my kind of uh, my personal encounter then with the formation and the, 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 the consolidation of a, an idea of Alexandria as this kind of Mediterranean space actually comes out of a, out of a larger fascist imperialist project. Uh, so it's a very new thing that wove this narrative of the, the Roman Mare Nostrum into this contemporary sea of politics, of, uh, of migrants both new and old, uh, and of, of a variety of peoples vying for kind of uh, different kinds of spaces uh, in that sea. And um, what I kind of began to see the city, and I'm, I'm going to wrap up my comments very fast, I'd much rather move on to a conversation, uh, that the city is not actually a city of myth and memory, uh, but the city is, is really a, a space of lives lived and lives still unfolding, and, and that it's not necessarily uh, or more or less uh, a, a city of myth and memory than in any other place, but it's, it's the fact that we remember it that way that needs to push us to ask these kinds of questions and say, why is it that we see this place as a city of myth and memory more so than we see other places? And just to kind of conclude, the, the image that was up here, unfortunately we can't go back to it, um, kind of encapsulates all of what I'm talking about. And uh, if you remember, there was an image when, when I was being introduced of a pile of suitcases and some old tables and photographs. Uh, this is inside uh, what is the, the elderly home for Italians in Alexandria. Uh, this is a building that was built in 1928. Um, it was built by one of the kind of premier fascist architects. Uh, and it was built to house between 200 and 300 elderly Italians. It was a big hit. It housed lots of people. They built another floor within four or five years. Um, it became really a, a central part of the community. It wasn't just a place where old people went to die. It was really a, a place that was living. Now there's about 20, 25 people living there. The halls are mainly empty. Uh, but inside one of the old uh, rooms, they've converted it into this, this uh, kind of museum, this kind of ad hoc museum, which is called La, La, La Machina del Tempo, the, the time machine. And I think it's a fascinating kind of encapsulation of this entire history of Alexandria because it doesn't consist of the monuments, it doesn't consist of allusions to Alexandrians, Alexandria's greatness, but rather there's, there's a, a rack with uh, a bunch of canes that have been abandoned. There are these suitcases. There's, um, there's a suitcase that's open and just filled with keys that people have left behind. Uh, and what, what's always kind of been most uh, uh, striking to me about this museum is that it's, it's there inside this abandoned elderly home, essentially abandoned elderly home. It's locked. Uh, and it was meant to be this museum that's really never been visited, except by the curious who's historian who goes and pokes in this place and opens it up. And, and I think since I visited it probably six or seven years ago now, it's, it hasn't been reopened. Uh, so I'm going to end there and open up from there. Well, I mean, that's, that's great. I mean, it's, uh, what do you, how do you interpret those canes? and those suitcases that are basically now become sort of like little historical fossils. Uh, because I have an equivalent one. When I went to the Jewish temple, um, I went there and there was a huge box filled with kippahs. And I mean, I don't know, there was 300 kippahs in there. And I think there are about three Alexandrians alive today who are Jewish. So, but these objects now, you, you can't just say that they're just there. 
they are resonating with a lot of history and, and in other words they, they, they scream at us and they ask us to do something with them and we don't know what to do. We can't throw them out any longer because they're proof of something. And I think that that's where maybe the historian and the mythographer sort of come together because um, it is still, I mean, these things make the city be re-become mythical, even though, I, and I'm not disagreeing with you, even though it's a thriving city, it's every film, every YouTube video that I see of Alexandria, it's noisy, it's filled with people, people are loud, they're happy. Um, so it, it's obviously a place that is, doesn't consider itself to be, in any respect, mythical. It's alive, it's not dead. Uh, I, unfortunately, I focus on the stuff that's not alive because, given my personality, what do you expect? Okay. Uh. I mean, we had um, interesting conversations uh, as you walk along the Corniche in Alexandria and you move to from Kayat Bay to where the uh, ancient lighthouse uh, once stood. Um, there's a pile of rubble right. there, which is used as the molo or the 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 wall to protect uh, the harbor. And many people say these are the stones of the ancient lighthouse. Of course, there's no way to actually quantify or verify that as there have been many uh, Arabic and Muslim um, forts uh, since the time of the great lighthouse. But there was a thought, maybe we should reuse these stones in the new building. And I thought, that is just too strange. <laughs> you can't, can't do that. It'd be like yeah, building the building out of the canes that you've got. We're making the doorknobs out of the canes. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that there's something, I mean, I, I think that the, there, there's no loss that happens there, and that's that's what's always been I, I, impressing to me about Alexandria. It's that this museum, these spaces, uh, that they, there's never been a, a loss, that they've continued to exist. They do continue to resonate, and they resonate within that changing constellation of entanglements and interactions that span through colonial imperial histories, that span through uh, breakdowns of empires and formations of nation states and all of that all over again. Um, I always think about it too and at some point I was asked to to give a tour uh, of, of the quote unquote Italian Alexandria to a group of, of students of Italian at Alexandria University. And uh, at first the professor said, yeah, so why don't you take them and show them like, you know, this building on the Corniche and this building over here and all kind of the sites of Italian Alexandria. And I had spent the last seven or eight months in the archives of the Italian consulate uh, where I was each day when I was going through a file of a family or a file of an individual, I was writing down addresses and the, the consulate would close at about three or four and I would go and find these addresses. And what I was finding was that these addresses weren't taking me to the places that people were remembering as the mythical Alexandria. They were taking me to the popular district, Atarin, Leben, um, and, and this area where there was kind of a clutter and a confusion that actually sounded a lot like what I was hearing in the archival documents themselves. And that's where I started to think also about this idea. The, the, the historian Will Hanley has a, a brilliant term for this. He calls it vulgar cosmopolitanism. And I really like that because that was, it's, it, there are different kinds of cosmopolitanism that shape the memory that we have of Alexandria. And I found that vulgar one was also very much a, a, a kind of part of the, the, the living and unfolding history of Alexandria that was never really lost. I've got a question for you. I mean, um, there are stories, so many stories of how people used to be on their hands and knees scrubbing the sidewalks clean of Alexandria in the 50s and that it was a beautiful pearl of a city. And something happened. Now you fall through the sidewalk and yes. you know, you're lucky you to trip. be alive. So what, what do you think, what, what was the switch? Um, what is the switch? Yeah, what, what, what ha where did it go from being on your knees cleaning the sidewalks to who gives a shit? <laughs> I think the explanation is so evident. Um, the people who actually created modern Alexandria left, or they were kicked out. Yeah. And it was a European city thrust in a country that and it, I mean, if you look at the map of Alexandria in 1840, 
I mean, there's almost nothing there. It's a tiny, mm. tiny yeah. little city with a huge bay. Um, and then you look at it, what it was in 1910, you have a stock exchange, which doesn't exist any longer, of course, because mm. they burnt it. Um, I mean, you have the, the, the people who created that city were no, lo are no longer there. And most of them came with all kind of some mercenary sort of project and they were, there was financial gains to be made. You have to realize that I think that one of the most important things that very few people know that after 1860, when the Americans stopped exporting cotton, it became, basically cotton became an Egyptian agricultural product that was sought after. And, um, and of course nowadays you have Egyptian cotton, but it's not really Egyptian cotton. Mm. It's the brand name mm. uh, that's gone. Okay. Mm. I, I'm not a place in Georgia called Egypt. Is that, yeah, yeah well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's one up north called Cairo, too. Yeah, that's <laughs> where Egyptian cotton comes from. <laughs> right, I mean, who knows what it is. But no, the, the point is that the, 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 the kind of cosmopolitanism, which was fundamentally um, officiated by, through the creation of an empire that was already in existence, the cosmopolitan disappeared. And that's the kind of Egypt I remember, although I came at the very, very end of that cosmopolitanism, so that by the time I was 14, French was no longer the lingua franca of the city. Arabic was, which makes perfect sense. It's, it's, it's an Egyptian city. But I was used to going to a store and you automatically speak in French and you expect this sales girl to speak back in French. No longer the case. And so you can see the sort of etiolation of this entire sort of cosmopolitan multinationalism, multi-religious and multi-ethnic society sort of disappearing and you can you can i mean nowadays you walk in the sea by the way i think that the italians who still are in egypt in alexandria they don't no longer go i was told they no longer stay at the italian um, resting house they go to the greek one because there are more people there <laughs> And they all speak Greek anyway, and the Greeks speak Italian. And you have this kind of re residual enmity that existed between Greeks and Italian. Yeah. Uh, that basically is, we're too old for this. So, and they stopped it. But it still perks up. The Greeks are, I'm, when we opened the Alexandria Library, a group of 3,500 Greeks chartered an entire boat, a cruise ship sailed it to Alexandria and arrived for the day of the opening. Is that right? It was fantastic. And um, just as a personal memory of this city of stories, um, there we had a big event with kings and queens and so forth inside the building. I walked in and I looked around and I thought, ah, this is great, but I want to go outside. So I went outside with my uh, tuxedo and everything and stood in the middle of this crowd of 3,000 Greeks. And then when they found out that I was the architect, man, they just went nuts. And we had the greatest time, and I thought, that's amazing that those Greeks uh, would do that. And why would they, you know, the, the heritage is so far away. But well, because most of them were Greeks from Egypt, weren't they? They were Greeks from Greece. They came from... from yeah, they, they made, but they were displaced oh, Greeks. Oh, displaced Greeks. Who have been... Because yeah. when I was in Athens a few years ago, I was invited by the Onassis Foundation. And I arrived there and I gave my little speech. And then they took me out to dinner, the whole Onassis crowd. And of course, what language do you think they spoke to me in? It wasn't English. Mm. It certainly wasn't Greek because I don't know Greek. Uh, they spoke to me in French. They all knew mm. French. Why? Because they were all from Egypt. The whole mm. Onassis Foundation yeah. is run by Egyptian Greeks. Yeah. Uh, and Armenians. There's a big uh, displaced Armenian oh, population as well. I, I don't know where they end up. Though Australia mm. is usually the one. <laughs> Probably. But you get angry, I, s I know, sometimes when you think about the change. You get really frustrated, I think. Uh, but I don't know if that's just... It's an affectation. Is it just you? <laughs> Maybe it's just you. No, I think that you ask any person. I mean, you go to my f Facebook and you will see people, every time I put something about Egypt, you have people sort of commenting and say basically, the, the word is that they use is yachasara, which means what a pity, what, what, a, what, what, what's the translation of the word? Uh, oh, what a loss. Nimet, you know what, what a it loss. means. Yeah. Yeah. Dommage, dommage, yeah. What a pity, what, what a shame. Mm. And that's the feeling, the city has still big buildings that were built 
when before my birth, but they're fast disappearing, they're crumbling, and some of the big villas have been turned into schools and mun municipalities. What's interesting to me is that when you look at the great um, zenith of Alexandrian history and time frame, there were similarly large cities in Mexico and in South America that were quite sophisticated, nearly the same size. I think Alexandria at its peak was about a million and the ancient um, Aztec oh, and, oh, okay. I well, mean, yeah, ancient, same thing. ancient times. Ancient, yeah. yeah, so, you know, you had um, uh, the Mayan and Aztec cultures at the same time. And of course, you go to Mexico City today. And, you know, it's funny, we don't really think of it in the same way as we think of Alexander, but it has the same classical history. It's it does. Just, it's it does. not Western history. Um, so it's just fascinating that we cling on to it in certain places, Athens and other places. The places we but hold Alexandria on. has a particular thing. It it, mm. it just doesn't go away. I I don't know what it is because it it's partly uh, history, myth, and but it also has an other side to it, which is urban. There's something fundamentally very urban and and very decadent. And it's very yeah. hard to speak of the Alexandria that we all imagine existed as a non-decadent place. Yeah. It's not Jerusalem. Okay. Uh, thinking I, of holy cities. I okay. agree that um, you know the the challenge is that, and you've said this before, and I quite appreciate it. Um, you know, the the city is of myth is so real to so many people that the real city almost just doesn't matter at a certain point. But you know, as you said, it does matter because yeah. it exists and it's yeah. completely thriving. I mean, it's mm. conscious of itself as a living city. Mm. And yet, when I go back, I'm expecting to see a dead city. Yeah. Yeah, and who it's, it's, is right? It's a reminder that that, that, that that mythic narrative of the city has actually more to do with the present than it does with the past. And it's, it's something that I've always found fascinating. In, in, and you talk about this, this lamentation of, over, over the, the loss of Alexandria that's expressed now on Facebook. I mean, I, I see it through some of the same people in, in that same network. Um, but one of the things that I always found fascinating and is that there's also been iterations of this throughout Alexandria's history, yes. in modern history in particular, is that even in Forrester, he, he talks about the decline of the city in, in the beginning of the 20th century. It's not what it used to be, right? And during every period, you have another kind of reading of Alexandria's loss, and yeah, it I happens as the city moves westwards, uh, or eastwards, sorry. Um, I think it went from nearly a million people to something like 80,000 in just less than a century, in the time of the Christian upheavals, when they chopped Hypatia up and everything. <laughs> Those were good days, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Hypatia, you know. <laughs> yeah, she's one of my great, all-time amazing heroes. <laughs> well, with Hypatia. <laughs> So that um, uh, we uh, can open up the conversation. I'm sure there are um, questions from um, the audience um, to start off. Yeah. I would like to know what you have learned about uh, or what you know about the French archaeological, undersea well, archaeological um, projects sure. uh, from uh, outside, just at the city yeah, walls. Sure. Um, and they claim to have discovered remnants uh, from perhaps the library. Or yeah. something. Well, real quick, and others will want to jump in. Um, uh, reading Forster's books of Ferron and uh, Ferulon. Sorry. Ferros and Ferulon. Uh, there is actually little hints in there of various characteristics of what was considered might be part of the ancient m palace and museum of Cleopatra, which was understood to potentially be in an area that's now flooded under the harbor. When we had read that, we, we designed a bridge uh, that would take, it was merely built for safety reasons to get people over the Corniche, which is highly trafficked, and it would penetrate through the library out over the Corniche, and we decided not to stop it and let it cantilever out over the water, and we believed that if you walked to the end of it and looked down, you would see the original location of the palace, or maybe see Cleopatra putting her hand into a, or Elizabeth Taylor or something. <laughs> or something. And so, um, so uh, um, we, we, but we weren't able to build the bridge for various uh, 
bureaucratic reasons. But the actual excavations that occurred under the water did find actually in the location that Forrester mentions the uh, remnants of, of, uh, of at least the palace. Now in terms of the actual library, I mean, you can put two historians in a room and they will kill each other before they agree on any characteristic of the actual contents or physical character of the building. But I will say this from my perspective, as unless there's a historian out there that's going <laughs> to kill me while I'm saying this, um, a library of that magnitude and of that nature cannot exist in one building. Uh, not not easily. It was likely multiple buildings. So as if you imagine a university library system, there's a math library, there's the, the science library, and there's a central library. Um, so it was probably a mul multiple buildings. The Library of Congress also is in, in a certain degree spread out, although it's more centralized than most. But it's very problematic, actually, the Library of Congress is so big. Um, you, you know, national libraries of that magnitude, relatively new invention. So um, it also probably wasn't all just a temple. It probably existed in some outbuildings in some ways. The other thing to mention, by the way, is the myth of the number of, of uh, books. Mm. People like to say there were 250,000 to 500,000 books. Well, first of all, books didn't exist. Yeah. They hadn't been invented yet, so if there was a book there, that would have been pretty damn cool because <laughs> they just didn't exist. Uh, everything was in, in rolls of papyri. To take a very small book like, say, Plato's Republic, it might take up to 50 or 60 rolls just for that little book, which is actually very small when you print it in normal book style. So if you do the math, it was probably 60,000 actual books, as we expect today in the Great Library of Alexandria, a very small number, but 250,000 scrolls. And that, those scrolls take a lot of space, so they were probably even partially underground uh, in some areas. The uh, archaeological excavations don't definitively define the location, size, or magnitude of the library. So do we have it? Uh, any other? We, uh, we saw. We saw just a glimpse of the library as we looked at those slides, but I wonder if you could describe uh, briefly what it looks like and why you built it the way you did, given all we've had to say about Alexandria. Sorry, I'll jump in. Uh, the library, um, as many people uh, learn about the ancient library in myth and in, as childhood stories, uh, and as all these kinds of strange reinventions that you were talking about, um, we knew that we could not recreate something that doesn't really exist. Um, although there were many people, I can tell you, while I was designing it, I would get regularly, once every couple of weeks, a, a letter that says, here's what it looked like, do it just like this. And then Carl Sagan would say, here's the library on na national uh, television. And so everybody wanted it to be like that. But the only thing we could say was that even people from Asia, people from South America, they all had a feeling of what this thing was. So we had to find some characteristic of the building that everyone could relate to, whether you were from South Korea or from Chile or from Germany. Um, so the circular form, the building is a circle. Circle is something that we all recognize. It's a cyclical uh, reincarnation of things. Um, the circle is a platonic form, which also relates to the history of science in the building. Um, it's tilted, and it actually tilts towards, uh, towards Europe, towards the north. So it looks towards its home. Of, uh, in the Hellenistic Empire, and as it lifts up, practically speaking, it rises this giant wall of granite towards the Sahara, so that the great sands of Africa blow against the building. Um, and uh, I would say, in general, it has a feeling of, of openness, which is uh, something that allows people to feel comfortable and connected to their place. Um, I know that when people walk into the great room of the library, they often say their blood pressure drops. Um, you just kind of change your, your character, and that's partly because of this crazy city that it exists in where there are chickens running around. And I, my favorite view, memory of Alexandria was I was going down the street and there was a donkey with a 72-inch uh, plasma screen TV tied to the side <laughs> of it. You know, that kind of stuff happens there, you know, and then you walk into this room and it's just so wonderfully pleasant. Yeah. Uh, from your three perspectives, which I found fascinating, what does Alexandria say to us today? Mm -hmm. The historian, we have a, yeah, an author. Is, this is for the historian. 
That's not fair. All three have to answer. Well, I, I think I go back to the to how I encountered my own experience with Alexandria to answer that question, and, and that the. the uh, like so many places, it's it's a place that's constantly in search of of its own future, and I th I think that it, to a certain extent the 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 library is is what that is about, um, and I think that that also has to be part of the dialogue we have with the mythic quality of, of the city and of the place itself, and that uh, to understand that kind of temporal unfolding of the place, not just as something that's happening now or that's happening at a, at a moment of vast change, but as something that's always been part of the living character of that city. And, and, and perhaps that is something that Alexandria, more than a lot of places, can show us, that, 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 that uh, vivacity, that, that, that sense of always changing, always looking towards some kind of future that looks quite different in some cases from its own past. Okay, yeah. I get the hint. Yep. <laughs> it's, you, it's you, Andre. I think that, um, I mean, let's, let's sort of imagine something. Um, let's imagine that the whole world decides that they need to have a cultural capital that would basically house all the books of the world, all the knowledge, all the computer savvy that we have, everything is going to be housed in that city, that there are going to be endless series of cultural events, small like this one and huge ones, where every, every month you will have a huge celebration, sort of commemorating the culture of the world. Where would that city be? What would the name of that city be? I mean, it could be New York, which is unavoidable, but that wouldn't be fair to everybody else. Um, so you have to begin to think Paris, London, Rome, Milan, and you keep moving eastward if you want to be sort of more open-minded, um, <laughs> if you want to, okay? Uh, it, it would have to be at some point, and it's amazing that the Egyptians haven't figured it out. It would have to be Alexandria. <laughs> it, that's the only place that would be we're in the 21st century, so obviously there has to be a place that is going to become sort of the cultural capital of our planet. You can. Ha it is already there. It is there. Uh, but it would be sort of the cultural Amazon. You know, it's alexandria.com, okay? Uh, whatever you want to call it. But that's what, that's what the future, that's the lesson we have to learn. Now, here's one problem, is that Nasser, one of the, it is reputed that Nasser's ideology, among other things, was to de-Europeanize Alexandria. That was his mission. He was going to move everything to Cairo. Mm -hmm. Cairo was really going to become the capital of Egypt. And Alexandria, with all its nonsense European and Western <coughs> heritage and baggage was going to be dumped. And you know what? It worked. It has worked because Alexandria is now a city that's fundamentally dangerous a bit. Uh, I wouldn't feel safe going there. And uh, people do tell me, maybe you shouldn't come this year. Hmm. Okay, but I do come with attitude too, so that's not a good thing. <laughs> uh, but in, in essence, I mean, I mean, this is an exaggeration, but the fact is, Egypt needs to do something, and Alexandria needs to do something, if it wants to reclaim this place that it is rightfully Alexandria's. And I cannot say it in any better way than that. It needs to change, it needs to become <coughs> probably westernized. Hmm. Well, this is probably a good place for us to um, call the evening. You know, this uh, series uh, at the Academy is dedicated to topics that touch on the relationship between East and West. So Alexandria seemed like a perfect place to embody the tensions and the contrasts between ways of thinking. And so thank you so much um, to our speakers. Thank you, Andre, uh, Joseph, and Craig. Thank you very much for the discussion.
it, it proves that um, civil discourse can happen um, across disciplines. And before you guys take off, um, I do want to thank the Frankenthaler Foundation once more for um, supporting this work. And to let you know that we have another um, conversation coming up between artist Kara Walker, who is a resident, and John Lansdowne, who's actually a medievalist, who's just written a wonderful essay about Kara Walker's work. And they'll be speaking um, at Cooper Union, at Tom Main's uh, new building at Cooper Union on April 12th. So please join us uh, for that. And thank you all for coming. We'll see you next time. Thank you.